Hi, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, we've got Carrie Armstrong uh, presenting tonight, who some of you may have seen in the Royal Hango in a Royal Hangover, the documentary that um, was out recently. Uh, Carrie's been sober for nine years and is um, a really passionate sober Easter. She's got loads to say about it, loads of tips and advice about how she stopped drinking that she wants to share with you, um, and. Um, I'm sure she'll uh, give you loads to think about. So I'm going to hang over, hand over to Carrie now and I uh, hope you enjoy tonight's webinar. Thanks, Carrie. Did you, did you just say hangover? Hangover. I <laughs> love it. That's how we want to start this. Thanks, Lucy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's Carrie and um, I'm a Geordie, first and foremost, which is uh, why me and Lucy connect, I think, because we're both Northern Monkeys. And I'm a TV presenter, but I've been sober for a lot longer than I've been a TV presenter. I know that everyone comes to non-drinking in different ways, and um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about mine. But weirdly, um, I don't remember a lot of it. I was sat before we came on air, and I thought, oh, my God, do I actually remember my own story? I took notes just in case I don't. But... Um, Probably like everyone else, I started drinking when I was a teenager. Um, the only difference between you and I is I was a really ugly teenager. I mean, like, but ugly. Not just one of the girls that most guys wouldn't date. I was the one that nobody would touch. I was so unattractive. And so I had no confidence, because being but ugly in high school is not easy. Um, I started drinking when I was about 15. And... It was like this magic pill, in a way, because it gave me loads of confidence. It made me forget how much I hated being in my own skin. And I'm sure we've all been there. And I think a lot of teenagers do it that way. And I don't necessarily think that's a problem. And what was a problem for me is from my very first drink, because I was a good teenager. I wasn't like a rebel or anything. From my very first drink, I had this insatiable thirst. I literally couldn't stop. I was so frightened by what it did to me that the first time I drank, I got what we'd call in the UK, I guess, paralytic drunk. And it scared me so bad that I didn't touch it again for six months. I was still 15, tried it again, got paralytic drunk again, but for some reason kept doing it from that point on. And it didn't make any sense to me because I was such a good girl. You know, I went to school, I did what I was told, but, you know, I'd go drinking with my mates, you know, or my cousin on a you know, on the street corner or whatever, hanging around with your mates. And I, I was always the one that got the most drunk. And so it continued like that from 15. I went to uni, which in the UK, as in a lot of places, uh, my degree was basically in drinking. And I did it very well and very consistently for four years. I left uni. And the weird thing is that it, it goes in cycles, doesn't it? I wasn't off my face every day. It, it went in cycles. And when then when I was 21 and left uni... Um, everything fell apart because all of a sudden I had no routine I had nothing to keep me in check even though I'd gone to a really strict uni hoping that they'd sort me out I was the exception to the rule there so the year I stopped uni I thought right I I'll go to a really strict drama school that'll sort me out I'll find the best drama school in the world I'll go there and they'll stop me drinking and I got there and everyone else was a piece as well so I drank again luckily had left Newcastle to move to London to to kind of escape an abusive relationship because I got my uni boyfriend and I drank horribly we drank horribly we drank and we we shouted at each other we drank and we hit each other and he would you know do, do quite bad things and Drinking made everything better, it really did, and it got to the point where, of course, it very swiftly made everything worse, and the, the physiological impact kicked in at 21, where I would start getting anxiety attacks, just straight up from nowhere, like I was going to die, like my tongue, like I was having an allergic reaction, because my tongue was too big for my mouth, like I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't move, and I couldn't breathe, and everything was just I'm not naturally a person that gets depressed but that feeling you'd wake up in the morning like something was sitting on your chest and thank god I moved to London but the drinking came with me packed it in my suitcase took it with me went to drama school and was still you know in a really bad place because I was the really bad place uh, after drama school I decided to move to the countryside <laughs> oh god because uh, I thought right I'll move to the countryside I became an actor in residence for the Duke of Gloucester and in the countryside it turns out everyone gets drunk drinking's an Olympic sport in the countryside so it was years and years and years because I realized I had a problem at 21 
didn't know how to articulate it, would sit on Google and type in, how do I know if I'm drinking too much and what does an alcoholic look like? Because it totally wasn't one, obviously, but I thought, well, what do they look like? Um, what can I do to stop drinking and not be an alcoholic before I become an alcoholic? Or just stuff I didn't even know, because of course I didn't know myself. And when I was 25, I'd been on a bender for about six weeks. Because when you're an actor, you kind of can get drunk. The whole thing's geared around being drunk. And I wasn't drunk in the mornings because I was hungover and having acute anxiety attacks. But by the afternoon, I'd, I'd be drunk. And uh, I remember coming home and hiding the razor blades from myself in my house because I was really scared I was going to do something to myself when I was in a blackout. And that just seemed normal to me because in the countryside where I lived in Sussex, the pubs all shut at three o'clock. So I'd have these few hours of hating myself and not really being able to drink without anyone else there because, of course, I didn't drink by myself because I had those rules. And the rules were I didn't drink in the house. Well, of course, I did, but I was in blackout. It doesn't count when you're in blackout. Um, so, yeah, I came home and I hid the razor blades from myself. And I remember thinking, I don't think that's normal. I, I Like, there was a little bit of my brain that that knew that wasn't normal, that knew that wasn't okay. And uh, a couple of days later, I was sat at a house party, such an anticlimax. I hear these awesome stories of people who, who wake up in all sorts of positions that I'd probably been in and gone, right, that's it. But actually, for me, it was such an anticlimax. It came down to me sat in a room with loads of people with this absolute knowing that I was going to die, just this absolute knowing that what I was doing was killing me. And what really surprised me was that I cared, that I actually cared that I was going to die, that, that, that the thought of dying actually scared me more than the thought of, of living. So I thought, right, all right, then I'll stop drinking. So I did. And um, what I really want to talk about is how I fucked it up massively and how I'd do it differently if I did it again and the stuff that I learned. So, you know, because I, I guess we've all got that story. But um, I stopped drinking which was a really bad idea because I don't think I realized at that point that I was physically dependent on alcohol because I had a job, because I had a social life, because on the outside, didn't actually look much like this, looked kind of more like a boy and wore really cheap clothes. I didn't think I deserved more. Don't do that now. I like clothes. And myself, I like myself. Uh, but I went into physical withdrawal and I've never experienced anything like physical withdrawal. I genuinely thought I was dying, I was hallucinating, I was vomiting and you know the other stuff that comes with it. I was shaking so hard that I remember crawling to get kitchen towels, putting them on my head and them literally drying instantly on my head, crunchy. So I mean my temperature was just out of control. What I should have done at that point was gone to hospital because I think I kind of knew what it was but I was too ashamed to. Don't do that literally don't do that now I know a lot of people will say they stop drinking and they feel great straight away and it is nothing to do and I know I'm not a doctor but you know this, this isn't medical advice this is just me saying I don't I really truly don't believe it's got anything to do with the amount that you drink I think it has a lot to do with your physical makeup because I'm a big girl I'm five foot nine and I was a lot bigger then and I think that's what saved me from getting in serious trouble but um don't be embarrassed. A lot of people will stop drinking, even huge amounts, whereas conversely, some women in particular will go from drinking two or three glasses of wine a night for years, stop drinking that, and their body goes into emergency mode, goes into physical withdrawal. Some people go on holiday, they drink a lot, they come back, it happens. So my piece of advice there would be, if you don't feel amazing straight away, if you do start to feel physically unwell, do not think you're making a fuss. Go to a &E because you would not believe the amount of people they, they see in physical withdrawal. And it doesn't always have to be these massive grand mal seizures. It can be anything from shaking to feeling like you have the flu to whatever. Don't do physical withdrawal at home because you don't know you're physically dependent on alcohol. That's what I did wrong. So I stopped drinking. And for me, this is when the interesting bit kicks in, really, because I... It, the huge catch-22 is it took me 10 months of being sober to admit that I had an alcohol problem. Bearing in mind I drank more than George Best in a stag night every day for, I don't know, 10 years really, but I still was in denial that I had an alcohol problem for the first 10 months. And it's a bit scary because all the stuff that you're blocking out when you're drinking, and let's face it, yeah, you start drinking for a reason sometimes, but... Once you create the chaos, you kind of just want to stop, block out the chaos, don't you? So once you stop blocking out the chaos, I'd wake up in the morning and all these memories would come rushing back in and I just couldn't deal with them. You just got to sit. I, the first three or four months, I just sat with all those memories and after 10 months, it kicked in and I thought, I really do have an alcohol problem. 
and it's ludicrous of course I had a flipping alcohol problem I was like the Usain Bolt of alcohol problems but once I realized that then I thought well I have to get help here because I was kind of rubbish at being sober I resented it I thought I was being really brave doing it it was basically my only hobby not drinking like it was a verb like it was an actual verb instead of living not drinking and I went on to um because sobriestas wasn't there then which is unfortunate so I went to a uh, woman for sobriety and my god I'm sure that you guys know that once you go on a forum and see people speaking like you speak whether it's in denial or observing their own behavior there is nothing like people using your language back to you unwittingly that switches that light bulb on and there was just hundreds of women that were exactly like me and I thought my god I do have an alcohol problem and so do all of you and only about 50% of you know it so whilst I was there um, still quite bad at being sober I got a bit of a fright there was a woman there who um, she'd been in the 9-11 attacks and suffered terribly with post-traumatic stress disorder and had gone from being a hard drinker to just an out and out abuse alcohol abuser and she used to she used to slide back and forth she used to relapse she used to go back on there and when it's a forum I didn't really take it seriously because there'll be some women that would drink half a glass a night and some women that would drink a bottle of vodka and it seemed to affect them in exactly the same way their consequences so it occurred to me that there was nothing really to do with the amount because this woman would go off on a bender but nothing more dramatic than what I would have done she came on the site one day and she said, uh, I've been on a bender for 10 days and I've neglected my cat and I haven't been to work and I'm going to get my shit together this evening. My dad's going to come pick me up and um, I'm going to go back to his house and I'm really going to nail it this time. And we were all, oh, good luck, wish you good luck. The next day her dad came on the forum and said he'd gone to the house and found her dead in her bed and she was 42 years old. And that, for me, cemented it. I've got to do this and I've got to make sure that my sobriety is bulletproof because this woman was just like me and I do not want my dad to come and find me in bed one day and, and find me dead because this thing took me. That's not good enough. So that really changed my life. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to learn the life skills that I clearly am lacking because I started abusing alcohol, you know, so long ago that I was just an overgrown teenager and I had to learn these life skills that everyone else learned while I was off getting pissed. So there are two things really there's a there's like this common psychological theory that says that people are motivated by two things people are either motivated by goals that they want to achieve or they're motivated by pain and I'm definitely motivated by pain it takes a big crisis for me to change my life and the first thing I thought was I don't want to be motivated by pain anymore I want to be motivated by goals and I want my goals to be shit that I don't even know. Uh, there was a girl that I used to live with in a compound when I was an actor in residence for the Duke of Gloucester and she didn't drink. She was like one of those mythical creatures like a unicorn to me and she didn't drink and I was fascinated by her. And um, she used to love Disney movies and she used to go to bed at nine every night and her world was clean and fragrant and beautiful and I thought, my God, I want to be like you when I grow up. Of course, I didn't want to be like her when I grew up. I wanted to be like me when I grew up. And um, that's one thing about sobriety. You know, you can have as many sober role models as you like, but creating your own life, creating a mashup of all the different things that you can find. And in this day and age of social networking and Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and soberistas, you can take the bits that you like out of everyone's sobriety and make it your own. I don't want to be, I, you know, when we, when we start abusing alcohol and we do rest, arrest development as teenagers, we think we want to be just like this person. We're going to go sit in our box and be just like this person. And um, you don't want to be anything like them. You know, you don't want to be anything like them at all. You want to be like you. And the exciting part about sobriety that I figured out, and when I actually started doing it right, was that I couldn't do it wrong. I couldn't do it wrong. How do you get it wrong? Finding out who you really are. Uh, I was really lucky after my first year of sobriety because I nearly died and ended up in a wheelchair. It actually took me a few years to get into the wheelchair. But um, I was housebound and I was at my lowest step and I physically couldn't move. My mum had to dress me and feed me. And I know that's not a typical story, but there are no typical stories. And one thing I'm really, really, really passionate about is, although there's no one way to do this, all recovery is the same. Your recovery from a job loss, recovery from bereavement, recovery from a boy or a girl dumping you, recovery from financial ruin, recovery from physical disablement and recovery from alcoholism or alcohol abuse or you know just stopping doing that thing that's hurting you they are all essentially the same and that's having faith 
And having faith is just believing before you see. Not believing everyone that tells you that 95% of people will not recover from this. Being your own recovery and knowing that you can do it and having that be a fact. Because I didn't know that facts are what we picked and choose. I thought facts were gravity. And that was it. Like gravity was a fact and being an alcoholic was a fact. And it's just nothing. Most of life is interpretation. I learned that... I learned that most of reality is not even 5% of what's in front of me. That reality comes from in here first. And I don't mean that because I read it in some airy fairy book. It's because I know, because I got sober and my sobriety is bulletproof, because I have faith in it, because I work on it every day and I work on improving on myself. I don't wake up every day and not drink. That's like getting up every day and not playing polo. I, I just, you know, I just get up every day. I just live my life. It's just now sobriety is just a side effect. What I wish I had known was some of the amazing bits about sobriety are that I completely changed shape. I have curves that I didn't even know existed before. And uh, one of the other fat side effects of sobriety is that I know who I am through trial and error. Another side effect of sobriety isn't that you get everything right. Uh, I was on the phone to my cousin the other day and she said to me, do you know what? You're proof that people that are sober mess up just as much as drunk people. We do. I make monumental mistakes. I throw myself at life. I, I massively mess up on a very public scale most of the time. A side effect of sobriety is finding out what you want to do with your life. I didn't know that I wanted to be a TV presenter. I didn't even know that I liked sports. And now I work in sports, I mean heavily. And that was a very recent discovery. It's like life just hands you stuff and goes, are you paying attention? Are you paying attention? Here you are. Here's some more good stuff. Here's some more good stuff. Here's some more good stuff. That's what sobriety is. It certainly isn't to me putting myself in a box and calling myself sober. To me, that's a very teenage thing. And I think that's why we fight so much in sobriety circles, which is quite sad. And you don't do it at sober roasters, which is wonderful. That there has to be one way of doing it. Because if there's one way of doing it, there's an equation and we can sit in a box and we can call ourselves recovered or in recovery or diseased or whatever. And it's nothing like that. It's completely tailor-made. What I do now, because I, I am a TV presenter most of the time, but I, I started, people started asking me, I never advertise anything, they just started asking me, well, can you teach me how you did it? Well, I can teach you how I did it. I can't teach you how it's done because you know what? You ever ask Lucy and I, we, we do things really differently. There are some parts to Lucy's life, like running, which I would rather eat my own head than do, but I can see why she loves it. Whereas she probably doesn't like to sit on the sofa and eat crisps a lot. That's kind of my thing. But we're both right. We're both right. For her, sobriety is calm and it's patient and it's all-encompassing peace. For me, it's like being like Jurassic Bunny and just throwing myself at things like a kid. We're both right. We're both absolutely right. There is some other things that I felt like I needed to say because uh, I was worried about missing them out. One thing I really wish I had known when I was drinking is that a lot of the time I was overcompensating for tiredness. I was trying to medicate against tiredness. And a lot of the time for me, I'm not a doctor, it can be an adrenal problem. So some people actually end up physically dependent on alcohol because it's a physically addictive chemical. You fuck about with that, excuse my French, you're going to end up in trouble, all of us. Of course, there are some people that have predisposition to alcoholism. If you've got it in your family, you know what? It's like having emphysema and smoking. Be careful. Check your family tree. We obviously know by now, if you're my age. But um, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're masking tiredness with alcohol, you will end up getting physically dependent on it if you're not careful. So try and address the adrenal issue if there is one. Uh, let's have a look and see. Yeah, don't let other people's don't let other people's statistics dictate your sobriety. Because, like I said before, if some people are motivated by pain, of course they're going to wait like me until they're dying before they get help. But if you're motivated by goals, you're going to want to get sober a lot quicker than they are and a lot earlier than they do. It is never too early to get sober. I have never met one person, trust me, I meet a lot of people uh, when it comes to this drinking malarkey. I never met one person that went, gosh, I wish I'd drunk for longer. I really wish I'd just had a few more years on the bottle. They all think, they all wish they'd given up sooner, no matter how little or how much they drink. We all kind of wish we'd given up sooner. It doesn't matter. The past has gone forever, as the woman for sobriety would have said. There's this thing that Lucy and I have talked about, which is the whole, I'll get sober and then. You know what? I'm going to nail this sobriety thing. I'm going to do it like it's a diet or I'm going to do it like it's a project or it's my new hobby. I'm going to get really perfect at getting sober and then I'm going to go out into the world. No. Uh, sobriety is messing up a lot. 
sobriety is getting out there and trying stuff and failing at it quite hard and then getting up and dusting yourself off again. Sobriety is figuring out that people aren't looking at you. Nobody's looking at you. Actually, that can be confusing for someone that's been drunk for a long time because usually people are looking at you when you're messing up. But that's only because you're ne we're negatively impacting their lives. If we keep getting drunk at weddings, of course people are going to notice our behavior because we're making a holy show of ourselves and interrupting their life. If we keep getting drunk in bars and people have to keep coming and get us, if we're in a relationship and we're messing up someone else's life, of course we're the focus of attention. But if you stop negatively impacting people's lives, they don't look at you. They don't care. We are literally not that important. So all this walking around feeling like everyone's looking at us and all eyes are on us, it, it's a lie, basically. So don't even worry about that. Uh, friends, that's another thing I would say. I know I'm dashing through these, but I just want to get as much out as I can. Uh, when I, <laughs> I don't know why we all do this. We all go a drink and they go, oh my god, but all my friends drink so much. Well, if you if you were a golfer, then all your friends would be mad golfers. They'd be so keen on golf. You guys would have spent all your time playing golf. It's like if you went to uni and um, or anywhere or high school, I guess. Um, you gravitate towards the people that drink like you do. And if you're lucky, get a couple that drink more than you so you don't look as bad. You gravitate towards people that share your beliefs and share your hobbies. And if your hobby is, I believe I'd like to get drunk now, please, then of course all your friends are going to drink. So waking up and realizing that all your friends drink, it doesn't matter because if you're anything like me, they're not your real friends. You're using them as a human prop. However, if you go back far enough and you've got those old friends uh, that, kind of, that kind of aren't your drinking buddies, then they might be the ones that are good at shaming you. So if you say to them, oh, I'm not drinking, they'll go, oh, yeah, well, I, I've heard that before. Or, oh, well, remember the last time you did. Or, well, I should think so. Look what happened last time you got drunk. Just take it. Because you kind of, well, not that you deserve it, but, yeah, you kind of did that stuff. But at the same time, who are they to judge you? Which brings me to another point. Don't have the conversation until you are ready to have it. You absolutely, if you did take up a hobby like karate, you wouldn't feel the need to go and say to people, oh, I've started karate and I'm probably going to do it for three months. Oh, I've started karate, but I might do it for the rest of my life, but I'm just not sure yet. People would think you were weird if you did that. Nobody cares. So you don't have to go up to someone and go, I'm not drinking forever now, and that's it. Because they're not. You're, what you're trying to do, or what we are trying to do, is hold other people accountable for your sobriety, which is kind of like why posting it on Facebook and stuff, I, I, don't, I don't massively think is helpful. If you want to do it, fine, but other people can't be held accountable for you being sober. It's completely an inside job, I think. I wasn't ready to talk about sobriety. I wasn't ready to talk about drinking or alcohol abuse for seven years. Seven years of not drinking before I knew how to have a conversation on a public level with anyone. I just basically didn't go out with a lot of people I didn't know. I didn't go to pubs and stuff. I, I just stuck with, you know, the other stuff that I like doing. I like going to pubs. I really do. I was in a really nice hotel that had a nightclub downstairs in Soho with a few friends a few weeks ago. And I had a silver service tea set. It looked like a right knob. There was a way to sat there with this silver service tea set next to me while like, I was having a dance. I love that stuff. I love sobriety. To me, it's elegance. That's what sobriety is to me. It doesn't have to be that to you to you it can be some earthy thing it can be in touch with nature I don't even care about that stuff like if that's for you that's great for me it's opulence it's elegance it's money I swear to god if anyone says to me oh my god being sober is so cheap no it's not you might not be doing it right if that's the case it's not about being a monk you don't want to sit there and self-flagellate with a cat and nine tails at the bar do you that's not hot unless you're into that sort of thing in which case you know fair dues um, but to me that's not hot, that's not nice, that's not sexy and sobriety is kind of sexy because you know a side effect of it is you look kind of nicer, you look kind I know that anyone that looked worse for stopping drinking we all kind of look uh, better, I, I swear to god I love clothes now I love clothes, I love hair, I love makeup sometimes I just feel sorry for the drinking girls because you get out there you look hot and there's nothing they can do about it whereas before I would, it's such a strange cycle I'd buy cheap clothes because I knew I was going to ruin them. I'd buy cheap clothes because I didn't think I was worth more. I bought cheap clothes because I felt cheap. I felt like I wasn't attractive and that nobody would be looking at me anyway unless it was in a bad way. And, you know, they didn't look at me in a bad way because I was usually off my face and fighting with bouncers. So it's not, to me, that's not it now. Find someone that shares your view on sobriety, and there are so many of us. If every single one of us stopped drinking, kept doing it, and that's the only key to success in sobriety, that's all you need to do. Stop drinking, keep doing it, find out who you are.
that's the equation as far as I'm concerned. Finding out who you are, well, that's a work in progress. We're all doing that. I just think that it's not necessary to suffer through sobriety. I don't think that I'm certainly not paying the price for sobriety. I don't even see alcohol anymore. I was in my house last night. I've lived here for a year. I mean, I put the stuff in here. I, I don't know who else would have decorated my flat. And I, I was I thought to my God, have I got a drinks cabinet? I've got a drinks cabinet in the corner. I'm not joking you. I was going to show you. It's filled with spirits. And it must be because when I have parties, people drink here. But I just forget it's there most of the time. And I was like, oh my God, you just don't see alcohol when it's when it's there because it's not for you. It's like I don't drive, so I don't really care about cars unless I'm being driven around in nice ones, which is nice. You know, if you want to sit and have a good glass of wine in front of me, I'm not bothered. I don't waste time on the questions like, am I an alcoholic? Yeah, probably. Who cares? I'm not drinking now. I, I don't care about labels. Labels are for teenagers as far as I'm concerned. If you know who you are, then nobody can label you. It's, it's, it's about knowing what you want. And a, a big part of my journey has been People would come and find me, like I said, and they'd say, well, can you teach me to do it like you did? And I'd go, okay. So I used to teach them for free. <laughs> Nobody listened. And then I'd be like, all right, I'll charge you 20 quid. Nobody listened. So then, because this isn't my full-time job, because I'd literally do this on the side, I would go, all right, then. I think, well, how much do people spend on alcohol? Well, I probably used to spend about 150 quid at least a month. So I'd go, okay, well, 150 quid. I'll do a 90-minute session with you for 150 quid. The same amount of people turned up, but they actually listened. So for me... There are so many, it's so silly because you see all these sober coaches and all these, you know, alcohol counsellors, which are wonderful. It's a great vocation, but there's no need for competition because this thing's an epidemic. There are so many people that, that want to learn tools of sobriety that every single one of you could take a sideline of being successfully sober, get people if you wanted to, show them how to do it. And the more successfully sober people there are, the more that we can teach other people how to do it. Never be afraid to never be afraid to charge for your skills or know your worth. I mean, I'd never make a full-time job of it, and I'd never confess to be something I'm not. I'm not an expert. I'm not a doctor. I've nailed sobriety my way, and if other people want to nail it and do it my way, then they come find me. I certainly don't advertise for it. Every single one of you could do that on the side. But more excitingly, you could find out what you really want to do with your life. Maybe some of you already know. The weird thing about sober time that Lucy and I say is that it kind of stretches. You kind of have so much more time when you're sober. You've got time to learn. I don't even know I like learning because when people were learning at uni, I was drinking all the time or being all of it or both time stretches you get to learn stuff every time that I want to learn something new it's not about sobriety it's about sport or it's about you know languages I'm learning Russian because I want to read in it I don't want to speak in it have you heard how much I speak I don't want to speak another language I find out more things that I want to do every single day and so much about sobriety has nothing to do with drinking so much about my life has nothing to do with, with being sober or defining myself as sober. And I never knew that. I never would have known that all those nights I sat up in my diary of despair writing, please, God, just let me stop drinking. Please, God, just let me do this properly. Please, God, remind me when I go out tonight that I don't drink anymore. None of it worked. What worked? Stop drinking. Keep doing it. Learn who you are. Like yourself. Invest in your sobriety. Charge at life like it's a flipping... One of those love ballads. Do you know which ones I mean? Like an absolute, what are they called? Those rock, glad rock bands. Like love life, like it's a flipping ridiculous rock band ballad. And you, for me, you can't go wrong. If you wake up every day and you're, you're so busy feeling love and passion, you can't feel fear. And that's my last tip, really. If you can learn to deal with, whether it's an adrenal problem, whether it's an anxiety issue, whether it's a depression issue, if you can learn tools to negate those, I fancy your chances so much more. I don't know what else to say, Lucy. What do you think? Um, I think that was really, really amazing. Thank you. I was fascinated. I've just been absolutely gripped. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry if I talk too fast. No, you didn't talk too fast. It was lovely. Thank you. It was really, really nice. And it was um, great and honest and um, I think a lot of people have gleaned much from your inspirational words thank you um, so there's I was going to say at the start, and I forgot, but if you wanted to ask Carrie a question, you could type it into the box at the side of the screen. And there have been a couple of questions people didn't oh. need me to tell them. People did think on and ask anyway. But um, if anybody else wants to ask a question, do it now, and we'll read through them, and um, Carrie will answer as many as she can. Um, the first one, I'm just getting back to it. Um, okay, so first one, 
is from Susan and Susan just wants to know how how you did it, how you stopped drinking. I mean you've kind of I suppose you've covered it in a really kind of probably I haven't. Way. Susan, that's a great question. It's you know what I knew I'd miss out the good stuff. Right. <laughs> this what I fit right, because I did it wrong for me. Wrong for me is that it was ineffective. It's not wrong for you. And I used to like white knuckle it, I think the AA lot call it. And I have love for the AA people. I used to not like you and now I do. So if you're watching, I think you're great. Um I used to white knuckle it and go, right, I'm, I'm not going to drink. I'm, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. And that, that didn't work. So I said, I gave up. I gave up justifying because I realized if I started justifying to myself and I started defending, then my brain would find a way back to alcohol every time. So I used to have a conversation every few minutes at first with my brain. And I'd go, oh, guess what? We're not drinking anymore. And my brain would go, oh, why, Carrie? And I'd go, I don't know. And your brain can't argue with that. Try it. Your brain cannot argue with I don't know. Not, well, because I have a problem because my brain would go, no, you don't. Uh, not because, well, I, I, I'm dying. No, you're not. Everyone, look at such and such. They've got a worse problem than you. I don't know. I'm just not. Well, how long for? Well, just not right now. Just not for the next 10 minutes. Just not for the next hour. If you just said to me that would last in nine years, I mean, obviously I stopped doing that and now there is no pathway that leads me neurologically or physically to alcohol. None. There is, I don't remember what it tastes like. I don't remember what it smells like. I don't remember having a hangover. I don't remember being drunk even. I just remember that I probably shouldn't do it because my life is so much better without it. That's the difference. I'm not running from something. I'm running to something and embracing something. So I had that conversation with my brain every single day for 10 months until I accepted that I had an alcohol problem. Please never, ever underestimate the power of I don't know because I don't know is kind of like I give up. I don't know. I just can't. And my brain couldn't argue with that. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yeah, makes. And, and I think, um, you know, that's that for me as well about what you said about not realising you had an alcohol problem or not not sort of accepting that you had an alcohol problem for so long. That was definitely the case for me. It was like I had this gut instinct that I needed to stop. But what my problem was, or how much of a problem I had, I didn't really acknowledge at all until much, much further on, like maybe a year or 18 months. Totally. And you were like, oh, no, it's just a coincidence that I always read drinking articles and that I yeah. have all these books in my house. It's just like a hobby that I have. Yeah. Very strange, it? and, and it's just the mind, just how much your brain plays tricks on you is, is just really weird. Um, okay, there's a, oh, somebody's asked for contact details, so maybe we yeah. could do it at the end. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know what, you can tweet me, if you don't want to tweet me, you can do my hotmail address, is, I have a hotmail address, I'm so disgraceful, I refuse to join technology, Lucy laughs at me, life after the chair at hotmail.com, I'll tweet it, or if I can tweet okay. it to you guys, you can retweet it, would that be okay, because I don't mean to worry okay. about that right now, yeah. uh, I don't advertise it, but like, if you Google me, you can find my email address, people tend to, but yeah, that's that's a, that's a good answer, I knew the answer to that one, thank you. Okay, fab, um, and... Uh, there's a couple of people writing as we speak, I think. So oh. if anybody else wants to write a question, for Carrie, do it now. Um, but whilst they're doing that, do you want to mention our little campaign yes. that we're... Yes. <laughs> Lucy and I, I very love Lucy, I messaged her a little while back and I was like, Lucy, can we work together? And she was like, yeah. And then we got on the phone and it was like, oh my God, I basically wanted to marry her. We were on the phone forever and ever just talking about all the stuff we wanted to do and how excited. Because it's like you're in a club and you speak the same language. And it's not the language of despair, it's the language of, oh my God, remember when you used to do that? And now our life is really good, that sort of thing. And one thing we realized is that we come from polar opposite ends when it comes to most things, you know, like the running and the eating of the crisps and the stuff like Lucy loves nutrition, don't you, Lucy? Lucy loves all the smoothies <laughs> and the healthy eating. And I'm like, screw that. Sobriety is about enjoying everything. And I mean, I'm a curvy girl, so you know that I'd be liking my food, right? Uh, for me, it's embracing everything except alcohol. I put that down. You've embraced that enough, my love. Uh, so I think eating everything is great. And she's like, well, this is what I like to do. And, and we realized that we were such polar opposites. But one thing that really ran true for us was how empowering sobriety is and how you don't have to be perfect to do it but to actually explore it and make it your own it's important to get in and get your hands dirty 
So we started a campaign that neither of us could say, but we've been practicing it, and it's called Sexy Sober Summer. And come the 1st of August, we're going to be running this multimedia campaign where we're going to talk you through summer. Because we don't call it a Sexy Sober Summer, we just call it a sober now, uh, summer now. See, we can't say it, Lucy. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> still, still can't say it, but we would like to give you visual examples because we think visual examples are so important. We want to get you on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. We want you to take photographs of your summer because believe it or not, as soon as you cessate drinking, as soon as you put the bottle down, you're having a sober summer. Literally, it's an instant transformation. So we want to know what you're doing with your holidays. But we want to give you tips on how to survive and thrive doing a sober summer we want to show you we want to help you and you help us to build a resource so that if you want to next summer you can come back and look at it we want to show you how to practically do sobriety in the summer or anytime you want but you know summer's so much fun you've got this time on your hands the kids are at home <laughs> yeah what a distraction so we are gonna this is gonna be blogging we are going to be giving you tips every single day, but we want feedback from you. We want you to show us exactly how you're getting in there, getting your hands dirty, messing up if you want with this summer. It's not about being perfect. It's about giving it a go and discovering discovering a new version of you. Because you know what? For so long, we, we both were under the misconception that suddenly being sober was going to change our lives. And actually... Yeah, it stops the chaos. It gives you breathing space to find out who you really are. But changing your thinking and being open to new thoughts, that's what changes us, isn't it, Lucy? Yes, very much so. And nicely, succinctly put. So this no, it wasn't <laughs> succinctly. I don't know how it is succinctly. That's your department. Um, I'm going to write a little bit about this campaign anyway and post it on Sober Easters. But, um, but yeah, basically as much kind of interaction as you can do so that we kind of all feel like we're doing it together. It would be really nice to build and like... We are. Yeah, oh, and it's been everywhere. Yeah, of stuff that we can all kind of use and read and reflect on and inspire each other. So we'll be, we'll post more about that on Sobristas. But um, there's loads and loads of questions. Oh, that, sorry. Okay, right. and lots of people saying how um, fantastic you are and how helpful they found your webinar. So, oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> get on with the questions. Um, do you hang out with your friends that you used to drink with? Ever? No. No, I don't think so. Um, some of them are dead, because that's what happens, believe it or not. This shit will kill you. Like, don't I don't believe in motivating through fear other people. I do get motivated through pain and fear myself sometimes, but some of them are dead, because that's what happens if you abuse an addictive substance. You die. Um, some of them got sober and changed their lives and metamorphosized into someone. You know, my career changed. A side effect of being sober is my entire life changed. My entire thinking changed. And... My my old school friends and the people I'm related to, they can't get rid of me. So I, it took them a long time to adjust to the new me. And I tell you what, I was at a wedding, and I've got like I'm I'm, I'm Catholic and Irish of descent in Geordie, so the, it goes without saying I'm from a flipping huge family. And I've got like 26 cousins. And um, I was at a wedding at one of my cousins, and weddings for me used to be at first, oh, an excuse to get drunk, and then oh, everyone's watching me because the can knew I had a problem. So we, weddings were like a source of stress for me. But then I got sober and went to my first sober wedding once I was out of the wheelchair and stuff. And there was a guy in the corner and my cousins liked him because he looked cute. So I went up and got his number and was chatting. And my cousins turned to me and were like, I love you sober. I love you sober. They finally got it that it wasn't going to be me being boring. It was actually me being the most fun I'd ever been in my life. And that meant the world to me. Do you know what I mean? So my cousins I kept because I love them. My oldest friends, the ones that I had before the alcohol abuse kicked in, I kept them. The other ones I don't have that much in common with. They're probably Facebook friends. They're probably people I'd see in the street and wish well. My new friends are these el elusive creatures that I don't really understand. You know the ones that can like have half a glass of wine and leave it to go warm and like forget it's there? Those ones that I just would never have understood back in the day. Those are my kind of friends. Bearing in mind I work in sports, so a lot of my friends are athletes. You know, an offshoot of being an athlete is that you can't really drink very much. So... I know that you'll probably see a lot of things in newspapers, probably in this country, particularly about um, football players. In the States, you'll see them about NFL players, and you'll see them all being party animals and heavy drinkers, and they're actually not. None of them are. Most of them are sober boys, which is why most of them I count amongst my quite close friends. You know, So my friends are sober, yet we don't sit in a corner and talk about sobriety. 
I don't want someone who's sober. That's a really crappy excuse to get to know someone. I want someone who will inspire me. I want someone who will excite me in a conversation. I want someone that I, I'm kind of like the Simon Cowell of friendships now. If I have a conversation with you and I don't like it and I leave feeling worse, well, I'm not going to be friends anymore. We're really not. That's it. You're done. You're cut. So luckily I don't, you know, I enjoy everyone and that's the offshoot of sobriety is that you enjoy everyone. Everyone is there to be enjoyed, but I only let a select few in. Do you see what I mean? I hope that makes sense. So it's not even about them rejecting you because you're not frightened of being rejected once you like yourself. Yeah, and I, that confidence and, and not being a people pleaser, isn't it? It's, it's just having confidence in yourself and being able to say no to people, actually. I don't really want to spend time with you. Whereas when you drink, you spend time with everybody and you've got no standards. We haven't got any standards. And the human props. They're like, oh, I look normal now. Like yeah. I used to date. I used to be a serial monogamist because I thought, well, I look normal if I've got a boyfriend. And like I had a boyfriend in years now because they're, I don't know, I don't care if I look normal, I guess, which is. <laughs> okay, um, here's a question um, which a little bit more serious, I suppose. Why does it take so long to come to grips with quitting? I've wanted to quit for years and have every intention to, but haven't yet. Um, and she's heard me speaking about how long it took me to stop um, and fears that she'll never be able to. Um, only to hope that she will do it one day. Hey, well, I've got to say, hope's a good place to start. Watch your language is what I always think because, you know, I, I used to, the language that we use is so telling, the language, the story that we tell ourselves. And I used to, I used to believe everything I was told. I was a sponge. I was a sponge for media. I was a sponge for what my parents told me. I was a sponge for what I heard out on the street. I was a sponge for what I read in magazines. And, if I'd read that, and I did read that 95% of people don't quit um, and don't successfully quit, I would have gone, oh, me too. Now, be very careful who you me too with, because some people in life will put themselves in the me too with the 5% and go, oh, well, you know, and be careful how you filter information. If you will align yourself naturally with the 95%, well, that says to me not a lot about drinking and a lot about thought process. That says to me somebody who you know you might want to get to know yourself a bit more you might want to find out where your weak spots are you might want to invest in I don't know going and seeing a life coach it might have nothing to do with drinking the actual fact that you can't stop drinking for a lot of people it's a neurological thing I don't know if you people talk about neuroplasticity plasticity I can't talk I'm a TV presenter um and it's to do with um action and consequence now I can absolutely tell you that I would know what would happen if I didn't look both ways before crossing the street. I would absolutely tell you that I would know what would happen if I poured boiling water on my hand. There's an action and a consequence there. I would even have known what would have happened had I picked a bottle of bleach and drank it. I did not have the nearest plasticity. I did not have the neurological connection between action and consequence when it came to alcohol. I knew enough to have a dread feeling in the pit of my stomach. Absolutely, I knew that something was about to happen, couldn't have told you what it was. And I, I do believe that NLP can help. I believe that cognitive behavioral therapy can help. I think that anything that structures, that helps to bend the structures of the brain and form new patterns, I believe, I truly believe that anyone can form this habit in 21 days. Yes, it took me 10 years. I don't think it should ever take anyone 10 years. I don't think it should take someone nearly dying twice Thank you, oh, sorry, twice, thank you very much, to stop doing it. It doesn't have to be that way. Don't feel that that has to be your story. Don't tell yourself that limiting story. And don't be like me. Don't be motivated by pain. Believe that you can do it and search and ask questions relentlessly. And don't think of it as failing. Think of it as evolving. I hope that makes sense. If you, you know what, if you want to email me, then feel free to. But there are so many ways to get sober. Please don't believe that there are none or just one. Is I mean, I, I hope that, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. One, th I mean, I, I always think I so wished Sober Easters or something like it had been around when I stopped drinking because yes. I think one I of know. the valuable things is talking to other people and going, oh my God, I have got a drink problem because I do what you do and you've got a drink problem. And because I was so ashamed of my problem as I saw it, that it was such a unique problem to me and I just didn't, I never spoke to anybody about how awful and wretched I felt the day after I'd drunk 
and I just kept it hidden and then I drank on it and and it was only, it's only now or in the last three years since Sober Easter started when I read what other people put and I just think oh my god if only I'd have known <laughs> five six years ago if I'd have known that you lot were all out there feeling exactly like I did mm -hmm. um, it would have just helped enormously so well, that is a valuable so thing just sharing and talking and connecting with other people I just think it's so good uh, obviously, I can't <laughs> believe it's over Easter's, but it is such a valuable thing to do, and really, really will help. I think if you keep doing it, that. Well, of course, of course, and just silly things like I brought some sparkling water because I wanted to say, like, from a practical point of view, you can buy it from anywhere. The models are available. Uh, from a physical perspective, if you're struggling with stopping drinking, I went to Italy when I was 25 for a work trip, and I was I knew I'd had a problem. I kind of was aware enough without discussing it with myself or anyone else to know at that stage I was too ill to do it in front of people. So I was like, how do I stop this physical craving? Sparkling water knocks physical craving for alcohol on the head. If you're in pubs and you're just starting this whole thing, drink as much of it. I love the taste of it now. I've had a physical craving of alcohol for about 10 years. I wouldn't even know. But, um, well, actually it would be eight years, wouldn't it? But try it. Try, the, try stuff like that. When it comes to anxiety, if people had just, if I'd known, and the one thing I tell anyone God, I wish I'd known this for when I was the next day in a ball of anxiety, rocking on the floor, too scared to leave my room to go to the bathroom because the fear was so prevalent. Vitamin B12, sublingual vitamin B12. If your body makes it, it doesn't even matter if your body makes it. If your body doesn't make it, you stuffed. If your body does make it, you wash it out with alcohol. And so many people can solve it. And I don't think you should punish yourself. Yes, of course, I'd also like you to stop drinking. But if you're not going to do that today, in the meantime, I'd like you to stop being crippled by panic attacks that would be okay for me that would be an easy way for you to see clearly to get over here it's little tips like that that we wish we'd known that we want to share with you and that's why Lucy works so hard doing this I'm gonna have a drink of this now actually um is that, is that okay what I said? Yeah, that's great. um okay how do you there's, there's two similar two two yes. fairly similar that you could answer them in, in the same uh, answer how do you explain yes. to others that you don't drink and then specifically, if you travel, how do you refuse the etiquette of being offered a drink? I love this question. Yes, because uh, I've totally nailed it after years of being afraid of it. When it comes to saying that you don't drink, it is not what you say, it is how you say it. Now, being British, we're quite good at apologising. And if you British ladies are watching, uh, and if you genteel, you know, other ladies are watching as well. Uh, oh, oh, Some people put a silent oh, I'm terribly sorry, but in front of there, I'm not drinking, which would go like this, oh, I'm not drinking. And they even say it to, as, it, as in seeking approval or as in waiting for someone to object and bite them or whatever. I'm not drinking. I don't drink. I'm not drinking. It's not a problem to me. And the second, you see, I stayed in for quite a few years after I stopped drinking because I was in a wheelchair and because I was housebound. So when I got out there, I was so busy learning how to walk again. I was so busy trying to look people in the eye and stuff that luckily I didn't spend too much time wondering about what other people were thinking, which goes back to my original. Nobody's thinking about you. When people say they want you to drink, they don't want you to drink. They want to feel comfortable around you. They want to know that you still find them interesting. And you'll go through phases because... At first, they'll go, oh, yeah, have a drink, have a drink, have a drink. I never get annoyed by that. So what? I was a dick, too, quite frankly. I was the one at the table at the wedding pouring the wine to make everyone else, you know, as drunk as I was so I wouldn't stick out. It's never about you. It is never about you. It's always about them and how they feel about themselves. And there is nothing that we can do in this world to overcompensate for a person that does not like themselves or feel comfortable in their own skin. Will they reject that on you? Yeah, if they're a dick, quite frankly. But so what? If they don't like themselves and you do like yourself, you're going to win. Of course, it's trial and error. Of course, and that's the fun part. Believe it or not, that's the quest. That's the challenge. That's the part that kind of excites you. Getting from the part where you're not quite sure about it. You're not quite sure how to say it. Would I absolutely go in and say to people on my first week of not drinking, oh, I'm sorry, but I don't drink? No. I'd lie my ass off. Do you know what you should do? Because this is what I did. Tell people it's a medical thing. Tell them you're on antibiotics. Tell them that you've got a stress related work also, which is good if they're your colleagues because they feel like you're working harder than they are and makes them feel insecure. Do anything that's going to shut a person down to stop asking questions that, quite frankly, 
you can't answer right now. You don't know how long you're not going to drink for. If you've done it before, you're trying to set yourself up for failure, leave it alone. Now you'll get to a stage later on in the night where they will try and buy you drinks. And bless them, people do that all the time. That bar that I was at in Soho, what I was saying, the hotel, the, the, the weeks back, uh, you know what, the non-alcoholic cocktails cost 20 quid, so God knows how much the alcoholic ones cost. Bloody rip off. Uh, and people were buying them because they were drunk and wanted me to get drunk and, and didn't. I don't say to them, oh, because I'm an alcoholic. I just say I don't drink. How long have I not drank for? I don't know, a long time. Doesn't matter. I'm clearly happy. I'm clearly have worked on being the most charismatic person in the room without sounding like a dick because I worked at it. Like if I was muscly, I'd be the strongest person in the room. I work that charisma because I want to overpower you, because I want to control the situation, because I want to control the tone of the conversation. Most of the work is done before you've got to the part where they order the drinks, if you see what I mean. Don't have a conversation that you are not ready to have. Tell everyone you're on antibiotics. When they start wondering after the first two years why you're still on them, so fucking what? Be com I'm sorry about the swearing. Uh, be comfortable with who you are. Honestly, don't. It's not about what you say. And I do, I do things like um, I encourage people to write post-it notes and put them around the house. I'm not drinking today, or oh yeah, no thanks, not tonight, or just little conversational post-it notes, and you'll see them around the house, and you'll get comfortable with seeing them. So you'll get comfortable with saying them. And once you've got them off pat nobody will second guess you because like I said it's not what you say it's how you say it I know that was a convoluted answer but I hope I got everything in there yeah no that's that's right and I think practice is really like crucial as well and I read it loads about um practice your answer at what you're yeah. going to say so just lie even, even like if you real feel really stupid but set two chairs up in the living room and sit there and pretend there's somebody sitting on the other chair pretend they've just asked you oh why don't you drink and give yes. them the answer and do it every day for a couple of weeks and practice yeah. doing it. Say what you're going to say, and then it becomes Holy. so natural. And, and you say, Stop yeah, but it feels okay. weird. It feels really unnatural and strange when you're used to being the the big drinker of a group. It feels really weird to say, "No, I don't drink anymore." You know, it, it does take practice. Don't feel it stupid. Do it. It won't last forever because people, I mean, obviously most people in my life don't know who I was drinking. They think it's quite funny that I used to drink. And it doesn't fucking matter what you say. You get past the first couple of years of not drinking. People think that when I say I used to drink too much, that I had a wine, white wine spritzer and fell over. Not that I used to drink 20 pints in five ounces because they don't see that part of me because it doesn't exist anymore. I didn't suppress it. I eradicated it. I replaced it with so many new character attributes organically as I went along that people don't understand it. One friend says to me, I don't like it when you talk about that. And I say, well, that's a shame because I spent 50% of my life talking about this shit. It's ugly alcoholism alcohol abuse is ugly but recovery from that is beautiful and that's why sober girls are hot because we know who we are and trust me people like charismatic people men like women who smell nice who I'm sorry it sounds old-fashioned I used to smell like a flipping cigarette machine I used to smell like beer and I used to now I smell hot trust me because I've sprayed perfume like every 10 minutes I'm obsessed with it I love fabric conditioner I love ironing with you know I'm obsessed with smell all this like different stuff that you can have I love being a girly girl and there is not one man I mean you should I'm not being funny lads and lasses you should see the boys I date now sweet lord compared to the ones that I used to and that was back when I thought I was a lad and I thought it was cute and I thought it was fun to be like this really fucked up girl that that drank pints and like cried and stuff oh sweet Jesus you should see the boys that I date now drinking mocktails you just would die I kind of don't believe it most of the time I'm not gonna lie to you so don't let anyone tell you that not drinking isn't sexy because it's sexy as fuck quite frankly sorry yes. should I stop swearing I no I agree with you <laughs> It's funny. Um, okay. Did you have any days? Oh, we've got two questions left. Okay. So, did you have any days where you felt very low? How did you get through them? So, I suppose like learning new strategies for negative emotions without drinking on them. Oh my gosh. Yes, of course. Because um, imagine you stopped distracting yourself. You stopped blocking out the pain. You stop. We call it medicating for a reason because it literally knocks the symptoms on the head. Imagine all the chaos you've created and then imagine stopping. Terrifying. It's terrifying to have every fucked up thing you've ever done. Coupled with the fact that you don't like yourself because people that like themselves don't treat themselves the way that we treat ourselves. So 
I, you stop and you're this unattractive person that you feel unattractive. So you have to be unattractive at that stage. Not everyone is, but I, I, I certainly was. Um, you have this chaos that surrounds you, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's mental. But bearing in mind, and that's just the, the chaos part, bearing in mind from a physical, from a physiological point of view, you have messed with your serotonin levels for years or months or weeks or whatever it is. It will take at least three months to regulate your serotonin levels. So everything that's happened, it's not in your mind. It's literally in your brain and in your body. Your body has to start and reset itself. And unfortunately, what I used to do was when things got painful, I used to go back to drinking. Your body needs time to level out. Take all the help you can get, as well as asking questions from people who've been there. Go to your doctors. Don't let them shush you. If they see, especially in this country, if they see that you're trying to save them money, by not having to go to rehab long in the long term or whatever, say to them, I used to drink a lot. Don't be embarrassed. Doctors can be fairly heavy drinkers too, so they understand. You know, tell them I've stopped drinking and I, I feel like my brain is trying to, you know, re-level itself. There are things that can help. You know, talking therapy is free. You know, if you Google talking therapy, there are people that you you don't have to have an agenda with that you can just pick up the phone and talk to. Talking to people helps because you see when we isolate. And when we keep this our dirty little secret, you can't get any sort of um, perspective. So if, sometimes just having someone turn around and go, yes, you're feeling low because your serotonin levels are fucked, it makes you feel more human again. It doesn't make you feel like you're lost in this place of mystique and that people are either gurus or they know nothing. We're all just figuring it out. So when you feel low, write a gratitude journal. There's a reason why these folk in AA have been here for 80 years. It helps to focus on gratitude. You cannot have a positive, a positive mental image or a positive body image and a negative world image. The same as you can't have a positive world image and a negative self image. It has to be both. It has to be all or nothing. So you have to, in a way, bombard yourself with positivity. You have to learn to filter to see the world as a good place. You have to learn to filter to see the world as a hopeful place, to see your body as something that can be saved, to see yourself as worth saving. You have to become obsessed with happiness. And whenever depressive things happen to you, and I don't mean clinical, because if you do suffer from depression, get your ass to a doctor and get yourself medicated. You don't have to white knuckle through this. See the world as a positive place. Don't just ask sober people what they do. Ask happy people how they stay happy. Some some people never had an alcohol problem in their lives and are just really good at being happy. Do you see what I mean? Don't think of it as in, well, only sober people can help me. Well, only people who have had drink problems can help me. No, people that are good at life can help you. Expand your horizon. And you know what? Give us a bell. We will. We'll sort you out. Give us a tweet. We can pop you some tips. And come 1st of August, we're going to be doing 30 days of it, aren't we, Lucy? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, okay, last question. Um, yes. Oh, first of all, Donna said, uh, "Thank you, really enjoying listening." I'm 53, drank since 13, sober since 19th of October when she did a detox. It gets easier, and I'm living a good life now. It's fun. So, evidence. That's, That's amazing. <laughs> Donna, and then the last question from Polly. Did you give up any other vices when giving up drinking? Should I uh, give up smoking and go on a diet at the same time, or would that be too much? I think I know what you're going to say about the diet. <laughs> Got the way of fucking it. Uh, sorry, what was your name, darling? Uh, That's Polly. Polly. What a lovely name. Polly, here's the thing. Uh, I didn't give up anything because I didn't like sacrifice. I cessated, I stopped, I quit. Giving up to me is a loaded phrase that when I said it, it didn't work. Do you see what I mean? So when I gave up, I always went back to it. But when I stopped, I stopped. Um, I quit smoking the same time as I quit drinking. I do fully believe that I was addicted to the chemical that's produced by smoking and drinking at the same time. I believe for me, that's it. Could I go back to drinking now? Don't care, not interested. Don't even give it any thought. We'd just be bored by it, quite frankly. So I stopped drinking and smoking at the same time, and it served me very, very well. Uh, I don't believe that it would have aided me because I tried in the past to just stop drinking and then I just smoked more. So I would, for me, it set me free. I did both at the same time. I associate both together, and it was so much easier to cessate doing both so I would highly recommend it um, but it's all about your belief structure if you believe it's going to be more difficult quite frankly it will be diet Jesus wept no never now here's the problem for me and I know that Lucy loves her nutrition and let's face it it looks good on her I used to try and do 
everything right. Now, I became obsessed with healthy eating when I was in the wheelchair, and that's uh, it's an eating disorder or behavior called orthorexia nervosa, and I see a lot of it, and believe it or not, a lot of people that contact me that think they're contacting me to stop drinking, the first thing I have to ask, especially women, is, are you restricting? What's your diet like? Oh, my diet's perfect. Well, you fucked then, quite frankly, because for me, I've seen women in particular put so many structure restrictions on themselves that they snap and that's when binging starts and whether it's a food binge or whether it's a drink binge or a drug binge or whatever it's it's about putting such tight restrictions on yourself that you can't breathe and to me sobriety should be about being able to exhale so a natural consequence of now two things can happen because not a lot of women stop drinking believe it or not some of them still you know drink a little bit or whatever that ain't gonna work for us like we've never had one drink hello uh, now lucy stopped drinking kept doing it kept up the running kept up the nutrition and looks fantastic quite frankly she's like a hot athletic girl right now i <laughs> don't like exercise think it's a bit shit quite frankly would prefer to just eat chocolate and you know sit on my ass which is quite large it's nice I like it now what happened to me was I got curves like Jessica Rabbit and Gaza had a baby I basically look like a bloke doll I have no idea how it happened I've they're, they're, they're outrageous I'm like a parody of a woman it's, it's odd I, I look like a stripper that's like permanently on me oh so, so oh oh Sorry, I think there was the sound just went, but you've come back. It's okay. I think. Uh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, like a. Like a. So. Um, so um, basically, basically, what happened to me was I. To me was I. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Uh, it's intermittent. It just keeps fading out. If you hmm. keep keep going, I think it's okay. It keeps coming back. So I got kids. So I got kids. Because I don't do a lot of exercise, do exercise and exercise. my weight so not be my bum and it gave me a weight. So, so I would say in basic speed, she bullied the society and it's about embracing learning how to cook, learning how to cook, it's about being open and embracing about care and being care and being bigger. Like normal, like normal, 25 gone. So I would say, I would say, do the diet, yes, knock the drink, knock the drink on the head, and pick up other things, pick up pick up friendships, pick up, don't give up, I don't. Adam. Yeah, I think and filling your time as well. I think you know, like just that it's so important to find something else to do that you really like doing that you can throw yourself into because it just there's so much free time, like you said before, suddenly there when you stop drinking. And if you don't find something to fill it with, boredom is an absolute sod for smoking and drinking and overeating. And um, oh. yeah. I, I, and, well, and the nutrition well. thing is important, you know, it's something I do now, but I didn't do it for a long time. It, uh, the first year okay. and a half, okay. first couple of years, I, I was not focused on kind of losing weight or, you know, really watching what I ate or anything. And, um, you know, that's something that I've kind of got into recently. So I just I just think focus on the not drinking. If the, if the smoking and stopping smoking helps you stop drinking, keep stopping drinking, then do that as well. Um, but basically just try really hard to keep, being kind to yourself and put yourself in a safe place to stay off the booze. That's the important thing. Um, Carrie, your the sound is slightly, it's a little bit intermittent and you keep fading out. Unfortunately, because it's been so amazing and thank you so much, but I think that would be a good time to say good night. And we have got through all the questions now, so well done. <laughs> and you're talking very fast, but it was really good stuff. <laughs> um, so thanks ever such a lot. You're so are and um, I'm sure what you've had said, what you've said tonight will really kind of resonate with loads of people and help loads of people. So if anybody wants to follow up anything Carrie said, you can e email me on Lucy at Sobristas or email Carrie on Life After the Chair at hotmail.com. Yep, hotmail.com. Um, and look out from the 1st of August for the Sexy Sober Summer campaign across loads of different media platforms from me and Carrie. So thank you for joining us tonight and, um, and good night. And thank you again, Carrie. Bye.